War Plan Red was one of the color-coded war plans created by the United States Department of War during the interwar period of 1919 through 1939 to estimate the requirements for a hypothetical war with the British Empire. Many different war plans were routinely prepared by mid-level officers, primarily as training exercises on how to calculate the logistical and manpower requirements of fighting a war, and War Plan Red outlined the steps necessary for the United States to fight and defeat the British Empire. Obviously, this plan was never carried out seeing as the United States and Great Britain fought side by side in World War II and continue to be allies today. But let's imagine a scenario where this plan were to be carried out and War Plan Red went into effect. To begin, let's detail why War Plan Red would be put into action, and the answer to that is the Great Depression. In our timeline, FDR's New Deal definitely caused a minor boost to the American economy, but didn't make that much of a difference until the United States joined World War II. In this timeline, FDR would be looking for a much faster solution to solving the Great Depression. Around this time, his advisors would prevent him with the three rainbow plans, with War Plan Red seeming like the most likely to garner an American victory, as Britain accrued more damage from World War I than Japan or Mexico. After deciding to put War Plan Red into effect, FDR would do two things. First, he would introduce legislation to increase the armed forces. He would do this under the guise of giving the people jobs, but in reality would be preparing for war. Secondly, he would realize that the American public wouldn't be supportive of a war where the Americans are the agitators. To get the people on his side, FDR would introduce propaganda to be spread throughout the United States accusing the British of causing the Great Depression, and that it's the fault of the British why the United States economy is in such a bad position. If Congress passes the proposal to increase the amount of armed forces, this would worry the British, who would begin moving units to Canada in the thousands. Seeing this large-scale troop deployment right next to American soil, the United States would begin mass recruitment to the army, picking up thousands of jobless men looking for work. Because of the mass propaganda distributed throughout the country, public opinion of the United Kingdom is extremely low, with the majority of Americans willing to go to war. By now, a war between the United States and Britain is bound to happen, and it'll just take one event to tip the scales to start the actual fighting. The only possible event that I could see starting the war would be a small skirmish between British and American troops near the US-Canada border. While the casualties would be minimal, it would be greatly exaggerated by the media who would refer to it as a massacre. This would push tensions to the point that the majority of Americans would feel outraged and would want to seek revenge on the British. Soon after, the United States government would declare war on the British Empire, claiming to seek vengeance for the Americans that died in the skirmish. The US would begin by invading southern Canada. The American army would move at lightning speed, launching poison gas attacks in Nova Scotia, followed by a landing in Halifax, occupying the city in just three days. Because of this, the British Empire has lost a major Canadian trading port. In order to starve the Canadians of energy, the US would occupy the Niagara power plants and pour into Quebec and Ontario being met with high resistance from the Canadians. By now, Canada would have initiated Event Scheme 1 and would launch counter-invasion from British Columbia into the Washington state with the goal of taking Seattle. The resulting Battle of Seattle would result in a Canadian victory at the cost of thousands of American and Canadian lives. Seeing Seattle occupied, the US would try and do everything in their power to threaten Toronto and Ottawa, forcing the Canadians to surrender. Troops from Michigan would cross Lake Superior into Ontario and begin forcing their way down south to connect with reinforcements in New York. At the same time, American and Canadian troops would clash in the city of Kamoka, and over in the east, after months of brutal warfare, Nova Scotia would be completely occupied by the Americans. In the Caribbean, the Americans would be able to conquer the British-held Bahamas in order to establish a military footing in the Central Atlantic. However, by now, the British will have already arrived in Canada in large numbers with the priority of liberating the Maritimes. Large-scale navy battles will take place around Nova Scotia, with the British destroying a great deal of American ships. This would end in a stalemate, as the Americans will have already established themselves in the cities of Halifax and Dartmouth and would be able to successfully counter the British. With the American industrial might in full swing, the US would be able to break through Canadian defenses and fully occupy New Brunswick. Soon after the capture of New Brunswick, American troops would begin making their way to Montreal and Ottawa, causing heavy casualties along the way. As a response to this, the British Navy would begin massive bombing raids in Boston and Portland, along with sending heavy reinforcement to the Caribbean. With the American armies fast approaching Montreal and Ottawa, the Canadian troops stationed in the western United States would begin a massive evacuation of American territory while destroying railroads and communications along the way. 
By now, the UK would have realized that without foreign help, they will lose the war, so they call for the Commonwealth of Nations to come to their aid in exchange for future military support or even promises of land. New Zealand, a Commonwealth nation, will take the UK up on this offer and would invade and occupy American Samoa in the Pacific. The UK would then try and make a coalition with other major powers via the Society of Nations, but would only receive French material support. Meanwhile, the Americans would continue their invasion of the Maritimes, taking Prince Edward Island, but would sustain heavy casualties casualties due to the British bombing the Bahamas. Crossing through New Brunswick, the Americans would occupy the Gaspé Peninsula and link with troops outside of Montreal and begin laying siege to the city. After a couple months of an unsuccessful siege of Montreal, the forces would storm the city with a quarter of a million troops. The main casualties sustained during the invasion of Montreal would be in terms of civilians due to what I expect would be the heavy usage of bomber planes. After thousands of lives are lost, Montreal would fall to the Americans, giving them a huge boost in morale. Seeing a large portion of Montreal in ruins, the British would retaliate by launching a naval and air raid of New York City, destroying the Statue of Liberty in the process. With the British Navy being heavily built up, they would land in the Bahamas and force the Americans out through their naval superiority. Wanting to shut off Canadian access to the Pacific, the US would prepare for an invasion of Western Canada. Small advances are made from the Panhandle of Alaska, which are swiftly halted and pushed back by the Canadians. A Canadian counterattack captures Juneau and makes its way through the interior of Alaska to capture Fairbanks. At the same time, an American Pacific naval force begins the bombing of Vancouver. Using a mostly Midwestern force, the Americans will have mounted an invasion into the Prairie Provinces with little resistance. While the Americans are busy in the south, the Canadians will have finally caused Alaska to capitulate, giving them a boost in the Pacific. With winter fast approaching, the Americans would try a desperate offensive to cause Western Canada to surrender. This proves to be successful, and soon after, Edmonton, Regina, and Winnipeg are captured by the Americans. With the British desperate to capture a large American city, they begin heavy bombing raids of San Francisco, Boston, and amp up the raids of New York City. While naval skirmishes are happening around the American coastal cities, the US Navy will have captured Anticosti Island, giving them another footing to capture Quebec. While the Americans will be clenching victories in the east, a joint British and Canadian force will have repelled the American unit trying to capture Vancouver, buying them valuable time to conjure up a strategy to push the Americans out of British Columbia. In order to cut the populated Canadian south off from the coast, the Americans would be using a great deal of their resources to cause Quebec to capitulate. A force of more than 100,000 American soldiers would gather around Quebec City and would launch a huge assault. After tens of thousands of deaths from both sides, the Americans would after Quebec City, and the province would be severely debilitated. Because the war effort has been in full swing for years now, the American economy has grown an amazing 11%. Using this newfound wealth, the US government pours money into amping up the navy in order to protect the coast against now common British bombings. Over in the Atlantic, the beefed up American navy would meet a large fleet of the Royal Navy near Bermuda. Due to how much the American navy has grown in strength, it would allow the US to claim their first big naval victory over the British, destroying a great number of cruisers and destroyers. Soon after this battle, the island of Bermuda would be occupied by the Americans. With winter having set in, this proves to be successful for the Western Canadians, who are better equipped for the winter terrain. A Canadian winter offensive would liberate Edmonton from American forces, but this wouldn't last very long as the United States would move tens of thousands of troops to the area in preparation of retaking the city in the spring. Marching through the occupied regions of Quebec, the Americans would advance towards the northern shore of the St. Lawrence Bay. Meanwhile, since spring has set in, American troops in Ontario, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba would continue their push to take those respective provinces. The Americans, seeing as the war has been dragged on for far too long, would try and put it to a quick end by using a large bulk of their manpower and resources. Newfoundland is invaded by the American troops near the St. Lawrence Gulf, and a huge offensive is made towards northern Canada with the goal of retaking Edmonton and reaching the Hudson Bay. Western Canada would be fully captured as the Americans would have recaptured Alaska's panhandle and would fully occupy Newfoundland. The less substantial British army would have been defeated in Ontario, opening up Toronto to American capture. With the war being almost impossible to win for the British, and the UK public wanting the war to conclude, the British Empire would surrender to the United States. The entirety of Canada would be put under American military occupation after the United States and the British sign a peace treaty. As the first part of the treaty, Canada will be fully annexed into the United States as multiple territories with the option of becoming states in five years. Second, the Canadian province the province of Newfoundland and Labrador is to be divided into two territories, with each also receiving the option to become states in half a decade. Third, 
New Zealand would release American Samoa back to the United States. Fourth, in exchange for the British not paying reparations, the Bahamas and Bermuda would be relinquished to the United States. It's hard to say what would happen beyond the conclusion of the war, except for how World War II would look for the United States. Because of the high tensions between the US and the British Empire, the United States would likely join World War II on the side of the Axis, and would likely fight side by side with the Germans against the British and the Russians. One more thing I could expect out of the conclusion of the scenario is an independent Quebec. While Canadian insurgents would most likely continue to be a threat to the security of the US, they would be the most prominent in Quebec. Because of this, I would expect that the United States would grant Quebec independence while keeping good relations and most likely making the province an ally to the US. Beyond that, it is impossible to say how the world would look like today with the US controlling all of Canada and joining the Axis. Still, I would like to thank you for watching, and make sure to like and subscribe.